Okay, we have an incredible program for you in the next few hours. And um, we're going to start with a little bit of history, somebody who made history. You know, back in 1998, when Congress extended the copyright term, I think year after year at New Year's, it would roll around and, you know, New Year's would come and we would sigh wistfully at what might have been. But there was a team, a team at Duke University Law School. They weren't just imagining what might be. They were keeping watch all these years. They were always letting us know what should have been in the public domain. Why? Because they want us to remember what's at stake. Here today is that team. And the first speaker today is the founder of that Center for the Study of Public Domain. He is a co-founder of Creative Commons. He literally wrote the book, The Public Domain, and you can download it because he published it under Creative Commons license. Please welcome law professor, watchdog, visionary, Professor James Boyle. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thanks to, thanks to everyone at the Internet Archive. Um, Thanks, Brewster. Thanks for the internet. It, it's been great. I've really enjoyed it, you know. Um, there, quite seriously, um, but for the labors collectively of the people in this room, there are many, um, you know who you are. The internet as you know it would not exist. Um, we will talk about that a little bit in the presentations. But I just want to pause and say that this is a, a, a time of celebration and a time also to venerate some of the, at least of my heroes. Um, so on October 27th, 1998, the world changed. Um, the world changed because in the Sonny Bono Term Extension Act, Congress once again retrospectively extended copyrights, hoping presumably to incentivize the dead to produce <laughs> some more. The graveyards must have been hopping that night. Um, what that meant was that they hit a pause button on the conveyor belt of works passing into the public domain. It just stopped. And for 21 years, not one work came into the public domain because its copyright term had expired. On January 1st, 2019, that conveyor belt started again. <laughs> what should we think about that law? I would argue that that law was one of the most sweeping restrictions of speech in the history of the United States of America. This wasn't banning Lady Chatterley's lover or James Joyce's Ulysses. This was taking a 20-year swath of culture and saying, hey, for the next 20 years, even though the vast amount of this is commercially available, you can't sing these songs, you can't recite these poems, you can't translate these books, you can't take these movies and put subtitles on them. You can't make a rock opera out of my short story. Stop. Stop speaking. Stop reusing. Stop remixing in order to incentivize perhaps half of 1% or 1% of the works that were there. Great job, Congress. Great job. It passed unanimously, of course. What we're going to do today is talk about, in the words of a song of my use, how did we get here? Like, how did this happen? What have we lost? What have we now gained? What can we now do? What must we do to make sure that this kind of restriction does not, in fact, expand, that copyright is not extended once again, that its limitations and exceptions, which protect things like fair use or the idea expression distinction or the rights of computer programmers to innovate, that those don't disappear. How can we have private hacks like Creative Commons, like the Internet Archive's work in digitization, that actually seek to maximize the space of the commons, this shared space? So that's what we're talking about today, and the next panel, we're going to discuss it. I'm um, from, as, as Wendy said, the Duke Center for the Study of the Public Domain. Um, when we started it, there were many, many, many centers on intellectual property. Nobody apparently thought that it was worth studying the public domain, the, the red-headed stepchild of intellectual property. 
Our theory was that the public domain was as vital to creativity, to culture, as intellectual property was. Perhaps more important. What if someone were, what if a group were to study that? And so we will be talking to you today about that and talking about the ways in which we got where we are today and what we can concretely do about it. But also this is a party we're going to be celebrating. So it's my great honor to introduce the director of the Center for the Study of the Public Domain, um, who also happens to be my wife, um, Jennifer Jenkins. Um, Jennifer is my wife. She's also my co-author. She's the co-author of uh, an intellectual property book you can download for free, of course. Uh, she's the co-author of a couple of comic books, Bound by Law, which explains fair use to you, um, Theft, A History of Music, which is a 2,000-year-long uh, history of musical borrowing, remix in action, right? Um, and Jennifer is going to uh, give you a much better presentation about mine, about how we got here. Jennifer. Thank you, hubby. Um, I also want to thank Leela, whose name I just learned how to pronounce correctly, my apologies, and Tim and the Internet Archive and Brewster and Ryan and Creative Commons for putting this wonderful event together. Um, as James mentioned, I am the director of the Center for the Study of the Public Domain. That's our logo there. He's actually standing on the shoulder of a giant. And as you can see, there are, there are other little guys standing on his shoulders as well. Um, part of my job today is to get this group who came out on a Friday for the grand reopening of the public domain to care about the public domain. I think that's the very definition of preaching to the choir. <laughs> We're in a church, apparently from 1923, so can I get an amen? <laughs> I'm, I'm. Woo! <laughs> Why I care about the public domain? Why celebrate the public domain? Don't take it from me. Take it from Disney, because I think they may have made one or two movies that were inspired or based on works that were in the public domain. Alexander Dumas, Kipling, just a few, Burroughs, English folklore, The Ballad of Mulan, many public domain works featured in Fantasia, Dickens, uh, De Villeneuve, Jules Verne, Lewis Carroll, A Thousand and One Nights. Oh, I got more, Brothers Grimm, <laughs> Hugo. <laughs> Charles Perrault, <laughs> Hans Christian Andersen, <laughs> Carlo Collodi, <laughs> Charles Perrault again. I mean. And yes, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, who was in favor of perpetual copyright. That is a young Elijah Wood, by the way, well before Hobbiton. Um, I'm not trying to trash on Disney here. In fact, Disney is making the case for me about how wonderful the public domain is because they were able to create these beautiful films. And Disney often gets unfairly blamed entirely for the Sonny Bodo Copyright Term Extension Act in 98, when in fact they were one of many voices pushing for this legislation. My point being that the public domain has consequences. Consequences not just for creativity, but also as many people in this room know, for access. The copyright term lasts so darn long that by the time works enter the public domain, the vast majority of them are no longer commercially valuable and have not been for some time. Michael is going to talk about works that we've lost entirely, that didn't survive their copyright term. But even with works that still did survive, they've been forgotten. They're out of print. They're out of circulation. They're languishing in bat catalogs. When those works enter the public domain, libraries and archives such as, oh, I don't know, the Internet Archive, can make those works available online without having to worry about lawsuits, <laughs> where anyone can rediscover these forgotten works and breathe new life into them. The link between the public domain and access is not just theoretical. In fact, empirical work by Professor Paul Heald, I don't know if he's here, or whether I'm pronouncing his name right, and others have proven that when books enter the public domain, they're more likely to be in print. They're more likely to be available. 
They're likely to be cheaper in more editions and more formats, importantly, braille and audio formats. So we're celebrating the public domain because of its contributions to creativity, its contributions to access, and many of you are partying like it's 1923. I didn't get the memo. I could have bought, I could have bought a flower dress. Yes, works from 1923 are finally free for us to find, for us to use, for us to build upon. I've been lovingly writing this public domain day site for 10 years now. And every year I've had to write it in the subjunctive because it's like, happy public domain day. Nothing's going into the public domain, but here's what. <laughs> could have gone into the public domain. So it was a little strange this year actually celebrating works that were going into the public domain. This is our montage. If you Google Duke Public Domain Day, um, you can see the works that we're featuring. Uh, we didn't know about the Book of Mugshots. Great. Um, so a lot of you have been enjoying the works from 1923 already here today. I'll highlight one of them, speaking of choirs, um, Robert Frost's collection of poems, New Hampshire, that includes the poem beautiful poem, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Why did I mention choir? Eric Whitaker, the brilliant composer of the virtual choir works, and if you haven't listened to them, you need to Google them, go to YouTube this evening and watch them. Um, he was commissioned to write a choral work based on Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening in honor of a couple who had died within weeks of each other after 50 years of marriage. And it was their daughter who asked them to write the work because it was her favorite poem. He wrote it, he loved it, she loved it. He got a nasty gram from Frost's estate and publishers sternly forbidding him from using the poem. So he had to bury his piece. The next Eric Whitaker is not gonna face that frustration or anyone who wants to translate the poem or turn it into a film or turn it into a rock opera, which would be strange, but sure. <laughs> um, so yes, so we are celebrating, we're educating, we're motivating, but the celebration has an asterisk. We had to wait 95 years for these works to enter the public domain. That's a really long time. Under the terms that we had until 1978, an initial term of 28 years, renewable for another 28 years, 56 years, we could be partying. Oh, I forgot a slide. I'm going to get there. Um, Jennifer, we would like more detail on those works from 1923. Aren't you an academic? Didn't you do additional research? There's a spreadsheet on our website with thousands of works, and you want some data on these works from 1923? We got the author, we got the name, we got the publication date, we got the renewal information. So we have a spreadsheet on our site that my assistant, Balfour Smith, took the entire year combing through the catalog of copyright entries to put together. So you want to see some other works from 23? They're on our website. Yay, Balfour. <laughs> Under that 56-year term that we had until 1978, we could party like it's 1962. You look pretty good, and I think some of those 1962 clothes, Brewster. Um, the works that would have entered the public domain this year, it's a bumper crop. Just look at some of them. The book, A Wrinkle in Time, Lawrence of Arabia, The Longest Day, The Song, Dylan's Song, Blowing in the Wind. Um, we have cataloged these on our website. The books in particular, we have Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? We have A Clockwork Orange. We have The Structure of Scientific Re uh, Revolutions. We have Something Wicked This Way Comes. We could be partying like it's 1962, but that's not all. Because as I mentioned, you used to have to renew to maintain your copyright. After the first 28 years, studies show that 85% of authors, publishers did not renew, in most cases because the works were no longer commercially valuable. 93% of books did not renew. What that means is that we could be partying like it's 1990. <laughs> <laughs> No, we wouldn't be getting these works, because these works were successful, and they probably would have renewed. But I wanted to show them to you anyway. <laughs> We'd be getting the other 85% of works that didn't have the brilliance, staying power, cultural impact of MC Hammer's You Can't Touch This. <laughs> so we would be partying like it's 1990. So, Professor Borrell, I'm calling my own husband Professor Borrell. <laughs> We talk to students, right? Hubby yes. is going to talk a little about, yeah, the public domain is immensely valuable. We love it. That's why we all gather here. But it was 
hasn't really been shrinking. This is not like an exact representation. I didn't do the math, but let's just suffice to say it's been shrinking exponentially. So the good news is the freeze, the 20-year freeze on the public domain is over. And we can get in, woohoo! We can get in our time machine. We can go back to 1923. Read them freely, and you may. Share them, and you may, I say. And to that, I say amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> Young Michael. No, introduce him. Huh? OK, so yes. now I am introducing. Do you have a title slide that I can put No, I, I, do not, I do not have a title slide. Okay. You just advance. Well, so Dr. <laughs> Seuss. And so we are lucky enough to have with us at the center now Michael Wolf, former executive director of the Authors Alliance, one of the most brilliant students that we've ever had at Duke Law School. And we're thrilled to have Michael joining us and telling us about, so I know celebrate, educate, motivate. This is kind of the tragic part of the public domain, but it blows people's minds about the works that didn't make it through their copyright term and are lost forever. Thank you. Michael. Got it. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks uh, to the Internet Archive Creative Commons. It is such a joy to be in San Francisco, to be, uh, to be back here. Uh, and speaking about my, my, one of my favorite things, uh, what's motivated me through my, my professional career. Um, I have lost my mic. I can just belt it out if it's... Is that fine? Can, can people hear me? No. Can people hear me now? <laughs> huh. Well. Hmm. Yeah, I, a handheld would do fine. Perfect. Oh, oh, and uh, oh, it. Are we are we good? No. You know. No. Oh no. This, this is why I prepared a dance routine. <laughs> I, I, I can give a sermon. Um. <laughs> uh, um. uh. I, I'm happy to proceed, but... Ah. Uh. I can't, I can't. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I'm hearing yell, I'm hearing don't yell. Um, <laughs> No, no, I don't think they're all, they're all they're all gone. <laughs> there, um, for my next trick. I'm going to sing the national anthem while drinking this glass of water. <laughs> Hello? No.
Um, I just feel like I need to speak every couple of minutes to just to just to just a test. I've got if if you have other funnies, let me know because I'm. No. Yeah, we yeah. Um thirty five minutes on. Testing. I, I, I'm a reasonably loud person, and I'm happy to go for it. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> All right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, we are going to do this like it's 1923, uh, which also gives me an excuse to be as enthusiastic as I have to be to reach the people in the back. Yeah. So, one of the things that is great about Public Domain Day is the treasure hunt, which we've seen from, uh, from Jennifer's slides of combing through the past and finding those things that are just so awesome that are, it's a moment of rediscovery. They've, they've been there, we know they've been there, uh, but we found them again. And what better experience is there than that? So, I, I wanted to show a few of my favorite things, uh, engage in a little bit of treasure hunting of my own, uh, and uh, having done so, I, uh, I came up a little blank. Um, not, not because there isn't cool stuff. We know there's lots of cool stuff. Jennifer's shown it. It's just not all of it is really quite in the public domain. Uh, so today is a celebration. I am here to celebrate. Uh, but sometimes you have to celebrate your fallen comrades. Those who cannot be with us here today, because they did not quite make the long trek from 1923 to, 20, to 2019 entirely intact. Now, some of those works that can't be with us here today uh, are still around, at least, we think. Uh, they're alive in some sense. They're just held in stasis. Um, this is a photograph of a library archives restricted collections section. Things that are subject to donor agreements or uh, you might also think of unique or rare items that are individually possessed or, uh, and under tight restriction. The public domain, insofar as you're just talking about the lapse of copyright protection, well, that doesn't necessarily get you access to do all the cool stuff you want to do with our cultural record with, with the public domain. So we have those works that are forbidden. A bigger problem, the sadder problem, the focus of my, my brief talk here, are, are those things that are just not found. Uh, the, you know, I'm 404. Uh, 95 years? It's a long time. A lot can happen. Fire can happen. Uh, somebody made a fire joke, and I almost, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was Ryan. And I, if I'm, when I'm in this building, I almost don't want to say it, much less put it on a big slide. Uh, it turns out burning is still incredibly destructive for the cultural record, or can be. Uh, sometimes fires are intentional, unfortunately. Uh, sometimes they're accidental. Sometimes it's the author uh, who wants to destroy their works, and under copyright law, generally that is their prerogative. Uh, or really, copyright has nothing to say with it. it. It's their prerogative. If Franz Kafka says burn it, well, if Franz Kafka tells you to burn his books, ignore him, uh, which luckily uh, his uh, his friend and associate, Max Broad, did. And that's the only reason we still have most of Kafka. Um, and of course, fire also happens for malicious reasons, for the er deliberate, intentional erasure of the cultural record. And God knows the 21st century has, or the 20th century has seen plenty of that, and there might be more still to come uh, ahead. No escaping it. Sometimes things just hit the dump. 
this image might be familiar to, to some of you. This is the uh, Atari dumping ground at Almogordo, where they took those E.T. cartridges of the games that nobody wanted to play and buried them in the earth. Now, E.T. would not be in the public domain anyway, and mercifully, thanks to the hardworking archivists of places like the Internet Archive, you can still play E.T. Uh, don't, but you can. But it, it still signifi signifies something, which is, it turns out when things aren't profitable, often the best place to put them is the dump. And the owner of the copyright, the owner of the particular copy, isn't necessarily the one who is stewarding it for its long-term posterity. Uh, perhaps the biggest problem of all is just rot. And rot can be the literal decomposing of organic matter. Uh, it can be the poor preservation of digital things. Uh, stuff falls apart. Entropy takes control. Uh, film in particular is notorious. The nitrate films that were used in the early 20th century are not built to stick around. So if you shut them up in a particularly a non-temperature controlled environment uh, and leave them alone, they start to look like this. They become brittle, uh, they become faded, uh, and eventually they just turn into unusable, unviewable garbage that you probably, well, keep it around maybe, but it might just end up with those Atari uh, cartridges. Of particular moment here, uh, of a, it, on this particular public domain day, where we're celebrating 1923, <laughs> hallelujah, uh, <laughs> and we have a backup. <laughs> okay, I'll try not to, I'll, I'm going to try to resist the urge to yell, because I've been programmed to do it, and now it's hard. Uh, This Public Domain Day is particularly special for works of film and particularly silent cinema. The heyday of silent cinema was roughly, 90, of American silent feature film was roughly 1912 through 1929. And that's what this chart represents, taken from a Library of Congress study commissioned on the subject. The bits in, I know you can't see the key, it's a little bit far, but the bits in red represent the, those films that are completely lost. The bits in the north that are multicolored those are ones that we still have, not necessarily completely, but we still possess in some partial form. There's a lot more red than the other stuff. 70% is presently believed to be completely lost. Hard to prove the negative. There might be some left that could change those figures, but from where we stand now, it looks pretty bleak. How did we get there? Ooh. Wholesale destruction, these are all quotes from that report. From movie studios finding it cheaper, more expedient to throw things in the dump. Uh, and willful disposal, near total loss by fire. Two of the film archives of the early movie studios, the major film archives, were completely and utterly destroyed by our friend fire. Uh, and all of this is in relatively minor compared to just the problem of rot. Those, those factors combined coming together means that we, are, we have already lost much or most of American silent cinema well before it ever made it to the public domain. Lest you think that this is some old-timey problem, that this is the, the Charleston of uh, cultural loss, it's not. We still lose things. Uh, slightly more recently, uh, the Super Bowl, Super Bowl I, the first one, uh, was not retained by the NFL, wasn't retained by anybody. The only copy is in private hands, and the NFL doesn't particularly want to pay for it, but they've threatened to sue if anything else is done with the film. So it's either give it to me for free, friend, or we'll sue you. Eh. So as far as in our current moment, you cannot watch at the Super Bowl one, not really. Doctor Who fans in the room? Come on, this is a geeky crowd. Yeah! Those early seasons took place in an era where the BBC had a practice of re-recording over old uh, other tapes. They were working as public stewards. They weren't wasting taxpayer money. Well, you're gonna uh, don't let that perfectly good tape sit idly by. 97 of 253 Doctor Who episodes from the show's first six seasons are missing. Occasionally they, they reappear, but uh, in the present moment, not looking great. The amazing thing 
is that by the standards of its contemporaries, this figure's pretty good. Doctor Who is a popular show. People went out of their way to try and save it. This is what good preservation looks like uh, when you're looking half a century or more down, uh, down the pike. Now, one of the happy moments here, and one of the reasons that this is a celebration, is that this loss is not necessarily permanent. Stuff does come back. Uh, this uh, particular film reel of a Doctor Who episode was unearthed. Uh, much, much of American silent cinema has been found warehoused in uh, the Czech Republic. There are literally uh, holes dug into the, uh, the earth in the Yukon Territory. The end of the line for the traveling, uh, uh, traveling reel-to-reel or films uh, that were going from town to town got to the Yukon. They weren't going to come back. Put them in the earth. This stuff is out there. It's now a literal treasure hunt. If you want to find the missing public domain, the unknown public domain, you have to go and do some sleuthing. You have to do some digging. You have to get your hands dirty. Uh, at the end of the day, it might be worth it because now it's 2019. The public domain is opening back up, and if you find it, you can do cool stuff with it that you might not have been able to do before. So that's worth celebrating, and it's also worth just tipping our hat to the stuff that we know is not coming back. Some stuff just won't. So here's to you, public domain, known or unknown. We're going to celebrate the hell out of you today either way. Uh, cheers. Performance. Maybe I'll stay here. Um, <laughs> that was amazingly good performance. I, I've only seen one tech failure um, worse than that, which is Jennifer gave a presentation on um, copyright infringement suits, uh, uh, things like blurred lines, where uh, there were claims that one song infringed another. Of course, the entire presentation is playing the songs. And she went to the World of Bluegrass Festival, and I said, have you checked the AV? She said, sweetheart, of course, it's a bluegrass festival. I think they can do the AV. That, of course, cursed her. There was no sound system at all. <laughs> so she got there. There was no PowerPoint. There was a, I would have thrown a Scottish fit. I would have had hissy fits on the stage. She said, your singers, sing it. And they sang it. So th that's the only thing I can imagine better than um, what Michael did there. So I'm going to talk to you about the, um, uh, the architecture of the, um, okay. I'm going to talk about the architecture of the public domain. Um, so the, um, how did we get here? The, um, you've heard about the 1998 Act. The 1998 Act extended copyrights retrospectively by 20 years. And that was bad. Um, it was bad particularly because the vast majority of, of works were works that weren't commercially available. So it did no good for all of those works, right? And yet it put them off limits. But an even more significant change in the architecture of the public domain um, happened earlier. It happened on January 1st, 1978. On that day, the 1976 Copyright Act came into force, and it made some really vital changes to the architecture of the public domain. Believe it or not, before the 1976 Act, 99.9% .9 of all works ever created went into the public domain. Why? Because if you wrote a love poem, if you made a home movie, if you wrote a diary, and you didn't file a copyright registration, that work was in the public domain immediately. It went immediately into the public domain. Only the tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of works where people wanted commercial protection were protected. So the public domain, which had been this sort of enormous thing suddenly shrinks because now all of informal culture, all of your love letters, all of your diaries, all of your home movies goes into copyright if you don't specifically say not, and it's very hard to do that. When Larry Lessig founded Creative Commons, he asked the copyright office, how do you put things in the public domain? And they said, quote, we don't provide that service. We're about locking shit up. Right? We're not about like, making it free, even when the creator chooses to. One reason why Creative Commons exists. The second thing they did was it used to be that to get a copyright, you had to apply, and then you had to renew, as Jennifer said. And 85% of all copyright owners said, no thanks. 
And it cost like $6. It wasn't like a, an enormously difficult thing to do. It wasn't worth it to them. So 85% of stuff that was 28 years old went into the public domain. All of informal culture plus 85% of stuff that is um, 28 years uh, old or more. So all of that went into the public domain. So just think how enormous that public domain is. That was the change in the architecture of the public domain. Now those are causes of sadness, but there's also some causes for happiness. The thing is, we're talking here about copyright term. That's just one of the dimensions of the public domain. The public domain is also all of the places where copyright is limited. Copyright never covers facts or ideas. Those go immediately into the public domain. The facts in my book, the ideas in my book, they're yours from day one. That's a really important feature of American copyright law, which people have sometimes tried to change. Oh, let's have database rights. What could possibly go wrong? I don't know, science maybe? Um, right? Like, what a great idea. What a fabulous idea. Let's lock shit up without knowing what will happen. Right? Um, how about, um, now this is going to get pretty technical. I know not all of you are lawyers. So, Pamela Samuelson sitting in the audience is involved with a case involving the question of whether or not APIs are copyrightable, uh, application programming interfaces. They're the way that you operate a computer program, and they're necessary for interoperability. Now, this is the technical part. Pam, this is a brilliant theory of her, she's a brilliant uh, law professor, thinks that these aren't copyrightable because they're methods of operation, they're the way you operate the computer program, and the Copyright Act says, and I quote, copyright will never extend to methods of operation. Now, I know that was hard, um, but a complicated idea, right? And um, uh, some courts have agreed, some courts sadly have not. We need to keep fighting that fight. We need to keep resisting the urge to privatize government data. In the United States, under Section 105 of the Copyright Act, anything that the federal government produces is yours at cost of reproduction. That's awesome. Other countries don't do that. Lots of companies will go, yeah, but that means you're competing with us. We'd rather get your shit for free, but have nobody else able to get it. That's something we have to keep protecting. We also have to engage with the various methods by which the public domain is renewed in ways by the choice of creators. Ryan's sitting there, Creative Commons is a private hack which says, if the public domain is denied to us, we will allow creators to make a choice how they exercise their own copyright. I have to say, I looked over to that part of the audience and goes, God, these people are stone-faced. <laughs> I'm getting no laughter from over here. I, I was actually kind of freaking me out. Come on, guys, break a smile. Um, <laughs> what we have here is something where there are many dimensions of this fight. There are private hacks. There are attempts fully to utilize the limitations and exceptions in the Copyright Act. The Internet Archive is involved in some of those, right? Aggressively maintaining fair use. Fair use is like a muscle. If you do not flex it, it goes away. This is actually true under American copyright law. Because then people say, well, I'm going to ask you for a license now. And eventually, if enough um, spineless university counsel give in to that, then they'll say, look, there's a market. And if there's a market, you're harming the market. And now it's not a fair use. We've got to keep policing the boundaries of fair use. This is all protecting the public domain. How did we get here? It wasn't just Disney. It wasn't just even um, people buying Congress critters, though there was a lot of that. It was a failure of the collective imagination. Larry Lessig, who's going to be speaking soon, argued Eldred versus Ashcroft in front of uh, the United States Supreme Court, saying, that the copyright term extension retrospectively was unconstitutional for two reasons. It wasn't promoting the progress of the science of the useful arts, and it was also an impingement on freedom of speech, with the American public getting nothing back. Later, in a case called Golan, uh, the US Congress decided to take stuff out of the public domain and put it back under copyright. And Justice Ginsburg, I hope she's doing well, she's a wonderful person, and we all pray for her recovery. On copyright, we disagree somewhat. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg said, we don't understand the idea that you have vested rights in the public domain. How could you have vested rights in the public domain? There's no rights to the public domain. She could conceive of no relationship to the public domain other than individual ownership. Is that the way you feel about these 1923 works? They're mine, baby. Well, let me tell you, I wrote the book, The Public Domain, and I trademarked that. So if I see any of you <laughs> using that phrase, I'm coming after you. 
We have to change our consciousness. We have to make people realize, just as the environmentalists said, hey, you know, development isn't the only thing. There's also this idea of protecting the environment, and it links together all of these struggles. We have to have an environmentalism for the public domain that first names its contributions to our collective culture and then defends them. That's ultimately the biggest challenge. In 1998, when copyright term was extended, the copyright term that finally today is ending, very few people spoke for the public domain. Who will speak for the public domain? Who will say, no, this is the, my future, my kids getting textbooks in school, this is my youth orchestra being able to play this, I want to be able to re-choreograph that, I want to be able to make a braille version of that book, I want to adapt that movie, I want to build on it and make a new version, and that links together librarians and software engineers and people doing archival research on life under segregation who can't use Super 8 video reels from the time because they're like, I don't know, there might be a copyright owner. And after all, even informal culture is copyrighted. All of these people have an interest in the public domain. Today, we celebrate that interest. We also have to help our friends, our fellow citizens, and our kids understand why it's important. Thank you very much. So I think you guys leave. All right, let's give it up for the team for the Center for the Study of Public Domain. Especially Mike, who was a great vamper here.